Welcome back. With this video, we're going to still be talking about uh, Zwingli, in a sense, uh, and uh, backing up to talking about Martin Luther somewhat, in a sense. But uh, this particular video will concern uh, a very important uh, issue and meeting uh, between Luther and Zwingli called, uh, called the Marburg Colloquy. And uh, it concerns the issue of the Lord's Supper and uh, the theology around that. And so uh, let's turn to that, the Marburg Colloquy, and understand uh, the differences between Luther and Zwingli uh, at this important uh, time or important issue and this important meeting. One of the main issues of interest concerning Zwingli in historical theology has to do with this meeting of the Reformers known as the Marburg Colloquy. First, we start out with, uh, uh, just to get you up to speed on what was going on before the colloquy, the debate that happened before the, this particular meeting. While both Luther and Zwingli rejected the Catholic doctrines of transubstantiation and sacrificial mass, uh, and again, we've seen this before uh, in an earlier lecture discussing that, or in the notes anyway, discussing this with uh, Aquinas, that uh, transubstantiation is the doctrine, the Roman Catholic doctrine, that the uh, at the Lord's Supper, um, at the Mass, as they call it, first um, Christ is re-sacrificed. This is the point of uh, the Mass. <clears throat> and that happens when the uh, the priest elevates the host or elevates the, the bread and the cup. And at that point, uh, transubstantiation happens. The substance of bread and wine transfers or becomes the actual body and blood of Christ. So transubstantiation, there's a trans difference in the substance of the bread and the cup into the body of Christ. That's the doctrine. <clears throat> there were. This is what uh, both Luther and Zwingli uh, rejected what Protestants uh, reject. There were differences between Lutherans and Zwinglians, uh, Zwinglians, however, over the Lord's Supper, and these began to be expressed in uh, something of a pamphlet war, this author says, a bitter pamphlet war, uh, between, uh, between the, these parties, between 1525 and 1528. The issue, Christ had said, this is my body, when instituting the Eucharist. Luther defended the literal understanding of that statement. Zwingli contended that the Eucharist was a symbolic memorial rite, although he was willing to accept something like a spiritual presence of Christ in the sacrament. Uh, but later reformers think of that spiritual presence as, uh, as a great deal more real and tangible uh, than, uh, than uh, Zwingli was willing to say. Luther believed that the words, this is my body, this is my blood, must be interpreted literally as teaching that Christ's body and blood were actually present in the sacrament, uh, in his language, in, with, and under the elements of bread and wine. Uh, this doctrine uh, Luther called consubstantiation. So again, the Catholic doctrine, the bread and wine, actually become the body and blood of Christ. Luther said that that's not what happens, but Christ is with, in, and under the bread and wine. Uh, those are the exact words that he uses, expressing uh, a, a much stronger uh, presence of Christ than the strictly memorial view of Zwingli. Furthermore, uh, he, that is, uh, Luther saw the sacrament, uh, and he still called it a sacrament, uh, as a means of grace by which the participant's faith is strengthened. So he saw that there was actually some uh, medium, there was a means, a medium of grace communicating something uh, spiritually significant uh, in the act of participating in the Eucharist, the, the Lord, uh, bread and the cup. Luther took issue also with Wingley's application of Christology to this local and eternal aspects of the body of Christ. Building on God's work in the incarnation of Christ, Luther said that although it was beyond human reasoning, 
It remains possible for God to be both omnipresent and local at once. And that was the doctrine of ubiquity. Well, if it's possible for God to be omnipresent and local at once, then it's certainly possible for Christ, who, who is God, to be local and present at once. Luther pointed out that, uh, pointed to the incarnation, incarnation as evidence that just as Christ can be local in a human body while all the time with uh, remaining with the Father and the Son, uh, omnipresent, so after the ascension, Christ's body may be found locally in heaven and at the right hand of the Father, as well as throughout the world in the Lord's Supper. Uh, you can see, this isn't on the notes here, but you can see that Luther sort of has mixed up the divine nature of Christ with the human nature of Christ. Christ's deity allows him to be uh, omnipresent, but his, uh, his humanity means that he is uh, local in one place at a time. Luther reasoned, well, if the divine nature can be omnipresent, well, maybe then the human nature and then the human body can be omnipresent at the same time. This is Luther's doctrine of ubiquity. So Luther's main problem with Zwingli involved his disagreement on the philosoph philosophical possibilities of omnipresence and the location of Christ's body in relationship to the Lord's Supper. Dwingley's, in Dwingley's conception, the Lord's Supper involved no real physical participation of the corporeal body and blood of Jesus. For Dwingley, the position of Christ's body at the right hand of God makes it clear that this body cannot be spread through the Christian world uh, to be eaten at communion. So Dwingley emphasized that Christ being in heaven, the body, uh, and the centrality of his spiritual presence uh, on earth. So you can see that really, as Wingley argues this, he's really, he, what he has in his sights here is the problem of the Roman Catholic view of transubstantiation. It's just that uh, in one reading, it could look like he is also uh, denying uh, Luther's doctrine of consubstantiation. And indeed, in many ways, he was contradicting Luther. When, Lu when Zwingli taught his doctrine positively, he taught it as a symbolic presence and that the, the Lord's Supper was a memorial service. So Zwingli regarded Luther's position as a compromise with the medieval doctrine of transubstantiation. And he maintained that the words of institution, this is my blood, this is my body, must be taken symbolically to mean that the elements represent Christ's body. Although Zwingli believed that Christ was present in and through the faith of the participants, this presence was not tied to the elements. So that's the part in which the real presence of Christ uh, was there, according to Zwingli. It really had nothing to do with the bread and the cup. Was, those are just symbols uh, so that the, the, it would remind uh, the uh, participants that, uh, they, that Christ was present uh, through, his, through his promise, through his word. And uh, they would have faith in that. So it wasn't tied or dependent upon uh, <clears throat> the faith of the communicants. Uh, this presence was, was uh, the, there already, uh, wherever two or three are gathered in Christ's name. That was the idea. In contrast to Luther, he interpreted the sacrament as a commemoration, and the idea of commemoration, memorial, of the death of Christ in which the church responded to grace already given uh, rather than a vehicle of grace. So he didn't think that anything was conveyed by that. And again, Zwingli had in mind that doctrine that we saw earlier, that uh, the sacraments in a Catholic system work regardless of whether anybody is uh, understanding or, or even believes in them. Uh, for uh, Zwingli, uh, that would not be possible. Uh, and frankly, the Lutheran position would also deny that. So these two positions were flying back and forth, as we said, in sort of a pamphlet war, or uh, they're back writing articles, pamphlets against one another. So from 1527 on, Luther and Zwingli engaged in this pamphlet, well, bitter pamphlet war, this author says. Yet the division in the Protestant ranks is not desirable, and so uh, several people looked for ways in order to overcome that, uh, particularly, again, the Lutheran princes and the leaders of the Swiss Reform cities. As a result, in 1529, Landgrave Philip of Hesse, that's a title, Landgrave, persuaded the two factions to meet at the castle in the city of Marburg 
to debate theology with a view to producing a common statement of faith that would provide a basis for, beyond just the religious agreement, a political and military alliance. The cast of characters at the Marburg Colloquy was impressive, including Zwingli, uh, Oakland Patius, uh, the brilliant patristic scholar, uh, uh, that's Oakland Patius, is the brilliant <laughs> patristic scholar, uh, Bucher, Martin Bucher is his full name, the Reformation's passion, passion, passionate ecumenist, uh, he's the guy that wanted everybody to get together, Melanchthon, who was of course uh, Luther's right-hand man, and of course Luther himself. On October the 4th, at the uh, again request of Philip of Hesse, Luther drew up 15 articles of faith based upon the Schwabach articles that he had written earlier, which uh, had been formulated before the colloquy. To his surprise, his opponents accepted 14 of these articles with only slight modifications. And even the 15th article, the one on the Eucharist, on the Lord's Supper, expressed agreement on five points and concluded with a conciliatory statement, uh, although we are not, uh, not at this present time agreed as to whether the true body and blood of Christ are bodily present in the bread and wine, nevertheless, the one party should show to the other Christian love as far as conscience can permit. So at that point, it looked like they'd come to some kind of uh, agreement or at least a resolution. Again, while agreement was reached on 14 and a half of the 15 points, that last outstanding half point, the nature of Christ's presence uh, at the supper, was the crucial one. Uh, no meaningful alliance was possible. Luther dramatically declared that Zwingli was of a different spirit. That actually, actually subtly accused that he might not even be a believer over this issue. Uh, surely... Uh, over the top and unnecessary, uh, but uh, typically Martin Luther, uh, sadly. Uh, the breach at Marburg was a, the point at which Protestantism divided into the Lutheran and Reformed camps, uh, a breach that uh, continues until this day. Well, that's a, an important uh, uh, event, and uh, again, in terms of the development of uh, Protestantism, uh, you can see there the reason for the two uh, divisions between Lutheranism and Reformed theology. We have a couple more of those kinds of divisions to look at further on, but uh, Marburg Colloquy is, is the key to that one. Well, we're going to uh, finish this, and uh, we will pick up in the next uh, set of PowerPoints and in the next two lectures, uh, the third of the Magisterial Reformers, uh, John Calvin.